Welcome everyone to episode 2 of Ohio Unsolved. Firstly, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their busy day to listen, and I am overwhelmed by all of the positive feedback that I've been receiving from the release of this podcast. If you enjoy this type of content and want to hear more, please follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and share with your friends and family. Writing and hosting this podcast is a dream for me, so I hope to be able to do it for years to come. Now, on to episode two. First, we have an unsolved murder that is rather disturbing, so listener discretion is advised. And second, we have a pretty creepy paranormal location. With all that being said, stay put, lock your doors and windows, and get ready for Ohio Unsolved. first story I have for you tonight is the abduction and murder of Amy Maholovic on October 27, 1989. For three decades, the FBI have been trying to find the man responsible for the disappearance and murder of Amy. There are people of interest, but no concrete evidence to convict. Amy was born on December 11, 1978 in Little Rock, Arkansas. She later moved to Bay Village, Ohio, which is a city located west of Cleveland on Lake Erie. In early October 1989, Amy began to receive phone calls at her home from an unknown man. He seemed to know quite a bit about Amy. He knew her name and her phone number, her address, what part of town she lived in, and he also knew her mother's name and where she worked. He even knew that her mother had recently received a promotion at work. The calls lasted for weeks until October 27th when the stranger had finally convinced Amy to meet him at the local shopping center, telling her that they were going to buy her mother a gift for her recent promotion and that he would buy her a present just for meeting him and helping him pick one out. But this was all just a ploy to lure the 10-year-old girl from the safety of her home. After arriving at the shopping center, Amy met up with this unknown man, and there were thankfully a few witnesses who saw her with the stranger. He was identified as being a white male of average height and weight. He was wearing a beige windbreaker, khaki pants, and a button-up shirt with thick, bushy hair. He was described to be in his mid to late thirties, but while he was dressed in a very presentable way, he didn't carry himself in the way an accomplished professional might. This was the last day that anyone saw young Amy alive again. It wasn't until February 8, 1990, that her body was found in a field off of County Road 1181 in Ruggles Township in rural Ashland County, Ohio. Evidence found at the scene suggests that her body was most likely dumped there shortly after her abduction. Based on the coroner's findings, her last meal was some kind of chicken, probably Chinese food. She had unknown gold or yellow fibers on her body, and probably the saddest of all, there was blood found in her underwear indicating that she had been sexually molested or raped. It also seems that her killer took some souvenirs. Like most serial killers taking a trophy from each kill, the unknown man took Amy's horse riding boots, a denim backpack, her school binder, and a pair of turquoise earrings in the shape of horse heads. There was also some mitochondrial DNA found at the scene, 
that the FBI hoped would lead to the identification and apprehension of the unknown killer. Before and after the discovery of her body, the Bay Village Police Department and the FBI conducted an extensive investigation into her disappearance and murder. There were thousands of leads and dozens of suspects were brought in and questioned to take lie detector tests. But in over 30 years, there's yet to be a single arrest. During the course of the whole investigation, there's been over 20,000 interviews with law enforcement still monitoring potential suspects. This has been described as the biggest search in Ohio since the disappearance of Beverly Potts in 1951. In November of 2006, it was discovered that several other young girls had received similar phone calls that Amy had received in the weeks prior to her abduction. The other girls who received the same type of phone calls lived in North Olmsted, a suburb of nearby Bay Village. Some of the girls had unlisted phone numbers, and it was discovered that the connection between all of the girls was that they had all visited the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. There was a logbook near the main entrance where the girls all signed in and added their phone numbers, address, and other personal information. The Bay Village Police Department collected DNA evidence from several suspects in December of 2006. And in early 2007, it's been reported that one of the suspects had retained legal counsel. In late 2013, retired detective Phil Tornsey returned to continue working on the case. Detective Tornsey believed that after Amy was kidnapped, she was taken out of Bay Village because the community is too dense and close-knit for the murder to take place there. He believes that the actual murder took place in Ashland County. In March of 2014, the FBI announced a $25,000 reward for any information that leads to the arrest and conviction of Amy's killer. In October of the same year, the reward was increased to $27,000. In 2016, it was discovered that a blanket and curtain discovered near where they found Amy's body contained hairs that were similar to her dog, and that possibly they were used to conceal her body before she was left in the field. In February 2021, around the 31st anniversary of her body being found, there was a major development in the case announced. A publicly unidentified man was implicated by a former girlfriend that he was involved with at the time of Amy's disappearance and murder. She told the police that he was uncharacteristically absent from their home, located conveniently close to the abduction site. When Amy first disappeared, he called his girlfriend late in the evening to ask her if she had seen the news about the abduction. He was employed in the same city, and he had a niece around the same age as Amy. The police interviewed him and said he had made some very suspicious statements, including that he may have met Amy's mother, Margaret. He willingly gave up his DNA, but he also failed a polygraph test. There was also a search warrant served to search a storage shed where they confiscated specific items of interest. Two of the witnesses from the abduction were brought back to a lineup and identified the man in a lineup of May of 2020. The new suspect's vehicle was consistent with what the man drove at the time of the kidnapping and the carpet inside the car was similar in color to those found on Amy's body. A vehicle of the same make and model was spotted near the dump site on February 8, 1990. Why there has been no arrest yet in connection with Amy's death is still a mystery. There is a theory that there were several men involved in her disappearance, and that they were all connected to a pedophile ring in Michigan, but this is only a theory and to date there has been no arrest made. In the aftermath of Amy's murder, her mother, Margaret, co-founded a foundation to help protect children from the same fate as her daughter. However, she suffered from lupus and died from her illness in 2001 at the age of 54. I, for one, am a little upset that her killer has never been caught. I know the name of this podcast is Ohio Unsolved, but this just feels like one of those cases that needs some kind of resolution. I hope that the detectives and FBI never let this case go cold and eventually find whoever committed this horrible act. 
Now with that being said, let's move on to our next story. Our next story is one single location and it's considered to be one of the most haunted locations in Ohio. The Moonville Tunnel is located in southeastern Brown Township in Vinton County, Ohio. It's about a two and a half hour drive east of Cincinnati. First, let's go over a brief history of the tunnel and the surrounding area before we get into the paranormal stuff. In 1856, the owner of the Marietta and Cincinnati Railroad Company started having some financial problems. His goal was to run the railroad through southeastern Ohio to reach Cincinnati. While he was trying to save money, he received an offer from a man named Samuel Coe. Coe's proposition was that they could build the railroad through his large property without having to pay Coe any money, but they would have to regularly haul large amounts of coal and clay off of Coe's property. Shortly after the train started to run, many people started to notice that there were many rich coal mines in the area. With all these new people moving to the region, the town of Moonville was established. The largest population the town ever saw was in 1870 at just over a hundred people. The main reason it stayed such a small town was because it was located deep in the woods far away from the more populated towns of the region. The two closest towns to Moonville were called Hope and Mineral, and the only way to reach these towns was to walk down the railroad tracks. One of the many obstacles that these people had to face was walking through the Moonville Tunnel to get to these towns. Many of the people considered this tunnel to be extremely long and pretty dangerous to walk through. Many times, while walking through this tunnel, people would come face to face with a train, and many people died as a result of this. This is one of the many reasons that people believe the Moonville Tunnel to be haunted. The last reported death was a 10-year-old girl on the trestle right in front of the tunnel. By 1947, the town was empty of people, and by the 1960s, the only landmarks still there were the Moonville Tunnel in a local cemetery. Some of the ghosts and paranormal activity that have been reported in and around the tunnel are phantom lights and footsteps. People have claimed to witness lights, described them as lantern-like lights appearing down the tunnel, usually accompanied by footsteps echoing through the tunnel or sometimes on the pathway outside. Another spirit that the people have seen in the tunnel is a lady in a white dress. She's described as a beautiful young woman in a white dress. She was killed in 1905 when she was struck by a train. The people who have seen her say that she just appears and disappears without any interaction. There's also a spirit of a tall man named Rastus Dexter. He was a miner in the 1920s that liked to enjoy his evenings with a bottle of moonshine and a poker game. Many people say that he was walking through the tunnel at night and even though he had a lantern, he was struck by a train and killed. One of the most popular ghost stories that has been told is about the headless phantom conductor. He's described as wearing an old-fashioned train company's uniform and carrying a lighted lantern, but he's completely headless. Some of the stories revolving how he lost his head are he fell from the train inside the tunnel, and there's another story that a rival conductor killed him to steal his job. Whatever the truth may be about the legendary Moonville Tunnel, it is a creepy location and a popular spot for ghost hunters. If you do decide to venture out there, be careful. You never know what kind of spirits you'll encounter. The third and final story I have for you today is the unusual case of the harassment of Bill and Dorothy Wacker that lasted for nearly a decade. This is still an unsolved crime against the Stark County, Ohio couple, so let's just jump into it. The first reported incident was on January 16, 1985. They had returned home to find their home had been ransacked. This was apparently the third time that this has happened to them, with the first two events taking place in 1984, 
but this was the first time that they reported it. Nothing else happened until July of the same year. Dorothy was home alone recovering from a recent heart surgery. There was a knock at the door, and it was a young man claiming that his car had broken down and he had asked if he could use their telephone. Being the sweet old lady she was, she agreed and let him into the house. The stranger then used the phone, and Dorothy heard him say goodbye, which led her to believe that he had left. Out of nowhere, she was struck over the head and knocked unconscious. When she came to, she found herself tied up, gagged, and alone. She managed to get the attention of a neighbor through an open window, and the police were called. When questioned, she was able to describe her attacker to the police. He was a young man in his 20s, blonde hair, blue eyes, and about 5 feet 9 inches in height. Once Bill had returned home, he was able to identify what items were stolen. The man stole a gun, an antique watch, a radio scanner, and a camera. They also found written on the wall, in crayon, cheap, but this will do. Four months later, in November 1985, the gun that was stolen was found placed on their front porch. The other items were also returned the same way one by one over the next few months. Shortly after this incident, the phone call started. They would receive calls at all hours of the day and night. Sometimes the caller would just be silent and all they could hear was breathing. They changed their phone number several times, but the calls just kept coming. Then they started to hear banging on the side of their house. Bill would rush outside but find no one there. No cars speeding away. It was like they just vanished into thin air. Bill then had installed some security lights to try and stop the banging on the side of the house, but that didn't stop them. Shortly after having the lights installed, Bill went outside to find a note on his porch that read, Your lights are a laugh. There were several other notes left on the porch, but the police never found any fingerprints on them. This kind of harassment went on for the next eight years. On October 27th, 1993, Dorothy was attacked in her home once again. She was rushed to the hospital for her injuries. She suffered a concussion and skull lacerations. It was at this point that the police started to suspect Bill for the abuse, but both him and Dorothy denied that it was him. In November of 1993, Bill had finally had enough and had decided to gather six members of his family to come and stake out his house. They each had walkie-talkies and all hid around the outside of their home. By 10.30 p.m., nothing unusual had, had happened so they all decided to call it a night and everyone left. That very same night, shortly after the two had gone to bed, they were woken up by loud banging coming from the front porch. When Bill went to investigate, he found no one there, but he did find a note that read, Get the message. On May 25, 1995, the Whackers were featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Unfortunately, there really isn't any more information about them after the episode aired. Did the harassment stop? Did anyone ever find out who it was? Sadly, we may never find out any answers to these questions. Bill passed away in July 1999 at the age of 79, and Dorothy passed away in July 2010 at the age of 83. A lot of people believe that it was someone that the Whackers knew. How else would they keep getting their phone number after they changed it several times? The police also believed that whoever was doing this, when they would leave the notes, they would write them with their non-dominant hand because they believed that the whackers would be able to identify them by their handwriting. There's all kinds of weirdos in the world today, but this just makes you wonder why someone would do this to an elderly couple for no reason whatsoever. There are people that believe that the Whackers were doing this to themselves or just making it up for attention. But whatever the truth is, we'll sadly never find out. Okay everyone, that is it for episode 2. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode and I want to thank everyone for their continued support. 
whether through the Facebook group or if you're just here for the stories. I would like to ask a favor to everyone, please. If you like what you hear and want to hear more, share with all of your friends and family that like this kind of content. Word of mouth seems to be the best way for people to discover a new podcast, and I want to see this one grow. It's already blown away any expectations that I had had for the first few episodes, and I want to thank all of you. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, could you please leave a rating and review? I would love a five-star rating just to help other people who may not know about us yet. The better the rating, the more people Apple will suggest this podcast to. Once again, thank you to everyone out there, and I hope to see you guys next week for episode 3. Don't forget to lock your doors and windows, and stay ready for Ohio Unsolved. Unsolved.